What's up, everybody? So, uh... <sighs> the reason why I'm laughing is I got this cup, right? It says, left us tears. <laughs> but we all know Republicans cry, too. So... Just so you know, this isn't that kind of a film. I just had some lunch. <clears throat> I'm studying for my master's course. But I just really want to honestly talk about something. Honestly talk about something, you know? Like that accent. Amy? So look, um, something's really been bothering me. And got a little OCD going on. Oh my cow. Damn. Now it's pretty much straight up and down. Something has honestly been bothering me. So I guess I'll tell a story. It would be good to tell a story, right? <clears throat> I like telling stories. Maybe not everybody is able to tell stories or likes to tell stories in order to get their point across, in order for me not to keep going back and forth, I'll switch that, flip that switch. So, before I moved to California, I lived in Alaska. And Alaskans are pretty independent thinkers already. You know, give or take a few that aren't. <laughs> but I used to be one that was leaning more to not being an independent thinker. Side note, an independent thinker can be somebody... Uh, on either side of the aisle. And again, this is a nice slash to uh, a Republican or a Democrat. This is individual thinking, right? I've been in some conversations about disparities and intersectionalities. And <clears throat> I used to think if you've heard any of my videos, some of them at least, I don't talk about it extensively, but I do talk about it. I used to think that I was oppressed. <gasps> the oppressed one. I'm so oppressed, the palms of my hands and my feet are white. I'm just a walking oppression. That's how oppressed I am. I ain't got a small nose, man. I've got an intersectionality going on here with a small nose. It's all over. My lips aren't big. I'm just, I'm intelligent. Dang, man, there's an intersectionality all over the place. I'm dripping with oppressive intersectionality. I'm sorry. Siri, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> Siri must be white. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. The CEO of Apple, he's white. That makes sense now. Siri, thank you so much. I have all of my meaning now. I have, I, I know who I am. Thanks, Tim Cook. Thank you, man. I was getting scared there. I almost didn't know myself. Okay. I'm authentically wrestling with something. I used to think that, honestly. I used to think that way that I was oppressed and that, that predominantly the white man or woman was my oppressor. And it really 
kind of was, was infused into my thinking as a young child, even in Alaska, right? But I'm not oppressed. I was made to believe that I was oppressed. I was made to believe that I was lesser than because, oh, the white man's got his foot on my neck and even before George Floyd, I'm not saying by any means that he deserved what he got. He died a tragic death. He ought to talk to his drug dealer about that one. Chauvin's the least person that you need to worry about on that. Regardless, I'm just saying, there's more to his tragedy than just the police officer Chauvin and the others that were there. Look, man, speaking of which, the police. So I don't believe that police should be done away with. I don't think that they should... Uh, be defunded. I think they should get all of their funding back and some, but I believe that with that, there should be some better training. As a person who understands disabilities and things that you just kind of don't see, not all disabilities are seen. I have one, maybe two or three. <laughs> But I understand that there needs to be better training. That doesn't equal defunding the police. Look around. You have enough retardation going on in our nation. And these people who are retarded have nothing to do with having a disability. They're just being retarded. Anyway. I used to be afraid of police. A police officer would roll up behind me I would literally start shaking sometimes and tears would come out of my eyes, right? I'm like literally scared, but do you know why? I was taught to fear them because of the water hose effect of the media I was digesting or just consuming. It's getting hot. I'm going to turn this off. My chocolate's melting. <laughs> All of the media I was consuming and not digesting allowed for me to be affected and affected in such a way that I believed that what I was reacting to when my senses picked up what I could not see directly in front of me or what I saw directly in front of me was my problem. The police were not my problem. I was my problem. So the media was my problem. And the stories and lies that they were protruding into my life and that I allowed to be protruded into my life. Let me tell you. Now, I'm going to tell you two stories. As I recall, the first time that I had ever seen or had an engagement with an officer that was fairly unpleasant was this. So, I was at my niece's house, or apartment, as it were, in the place called Mountain View in Alaska. That was the ghetto as we knew it, right? <laughs> anyway, that's beside the point, to a degree. I'm asleep on the couch. I don't even remember how I got over there. I probably was taken over there by my sister um, or my dad or my mom to go hang out or whatever. But uh, I'm over there. And I remember as I'm laying on the couch, <laughs> this dude, black guy, runs through the apartment into the back room. I don't think anything of it. I'm taking a nap, right? I'm like, man, this is a comfortable couch. I'm going back to sleep. Maybe about five, ten minutes later, I wake up. 
There's a gun in my face. I have no clue what I've done. I don't move. And this officer asked me, which way did he go? And I'm like, I point, and yeah, I'm a rat. I'm a snitch. Hey, look, I've got plenty of st uh, stitches in my life. So anyway, <laughs> before snitches get stitches was a thing, I just pointed. And he took off. He probably got him. They probably got him, whoever it was. I never told my mom and dad at all that I remember. I was too afraid. I had no idea. I didn't know what to think of it. Now, the first time that I had ever, as I recall, experienced a racism in my life came from another black kid. Get this. I've never had any issues from anybody white in Alaska as a kid, anyway. So, we're outside playing, and I'm talking to them, and they're talking to me, and then this other black kid says to me, you talk like a white person. Or no, 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 no. He said, you don't talk black. And I'm like confused. I'm like, I've never been told that. Like, how do I talk black? <gasps> Dang, it's my white palms. I'm, I'm screwing up. I'm not black enough. And my nose, shoot. But I remember thinking, what does it mean to talk black when I am black? And I don't remember ever having a conversation with my mom or dad about it. But I was always confused by that. How do you talk black? So then, you know, I'm growing up and I'm seeing all of the TV shows, like movies, like Minister Society, Above the Rim, Boys in the Hood, and, and they're... Again, I'm consuming all of this narrative, Alex Haley's roots, consuming all of this media that's telling me that I am the victim. I'm the victim. And I didn't understand how I could be the victim if nobody has victimized me, right? But everybody that was the victim was on these movies that were made up to pro or to to uh, not protrude, but you can use that word too, but to not only produce, but to provide me with a narrative of my life that was not true. You think about Alex Haley and Roots, right? Alex Haley came out and said that, yeah, he knew it was a lie what he was saying, but he needed to create a story for his people. What kind of story is that? Come on, bro. You're going to lie to everybody, making them think that Kunta Kente really, you know, was a thing, right? Anyway. But I've, I'm being led by this narrative that I'm a victim. And when my father died, oh boy. That really took off, right? Because now I'm in a single parent home and there's enough single parent black homes all over the nation, let alone Alaska. And, and now I'm like, oh, now I'm really like the victim or I'm really oppressed. And you enter um, the gangster rap that really took off in the 90s that that spoke of some uh, injustices that were really happening, but they weren't happening to me, but they were so prevalent and invasive that, that they made me think that that was happening to me too, or it could happen to me also, but they weren't. They just weren't. And to say that they were is a blatant lie. They just weren't. They were creating a narrative in the media that they want and wanted 
for the black community to live out. We never really stop to ask the question, why? And who's they? Largely, the government. White, black, yellow, pink, I don't give two flips power really doesn't have a color. It just has the greed that drives it. And it takes hold of any heart it can. So, anyway, so I'm starting to grow up. I'm a single young black man. Kind of grow up thuggish. Like, I'm a thug, you know, UGK. Yeah, baby, I'm a thug. Or whoever else. <laughs> I thought that was where I was supposed to be. Because that was the narrative of most of the black TV shows slash movies that were being put out in the late 80s and early 90s through the 90s. And now, absolutely now. But coming into the late 90s, there was a, we would call a cultural appropriation. We started hearing a lot of white kids, predominantly white boys who were skaters, use the word wigger because everybody else was in the black community was talking about nigga, right? So you had a best friend that was a white kid, right? Like I do, like I got one of my buddies, Tom. Uh, <laughs> man, we've known each other since we were young teenagers. That's my brother. I love that dude. And we were both going through the same cultural garbage at the same time. So he would say, you my nigga. You know, like, and I didn't have no problem with it, right? And yeah, man, you my nigga too. Just like a lot of people don't have an issue with it still. But then it became with the skater you know, skater groups, right? You know, just, I'm a wigger. Like, because we had to include, but then we would call that cultural appropriation now, right? Hip hop gave birth to a lot of that. And so we get this idea in our head, I'm the oppressed. The white man's holding me down. I can't get a good education because college isn't meant for me because everything I look at on TV, uh, predominantly that has my skin color, they're oppressed. They're playing this role and playing it up and putting it out for communities to consume, not to digest. So I grow up, coming back to the police, right? What was this, 2000? Maybe it was 2000, right? Um, was it 2000? I think it was 2000. So me and some friends, right, were we go to the bar and they were young. They were they were like a year and maybe even a little bit below a year before they could actually go to the club, you know, 21 years old, right? So one night I sneak them in to the club. And man, we had a blast. Had a blast. And we come out of the club sweating this like February or something like that. So it's like freezing, like like cold doesn't even like cold in February in Alaska. And we're walking along and this dude, black dude, reaches his hand out to the left and takes a gun from a car. And me and my buddies that are with me, we're like, oh man, I hope he's not going where we're going. So we keep walking, dude turns the corner, sure enough, I'm like, man, I hope he's just, he's leaving, and we could just go home, we're tired, we're cold, we had an awesome night. We turn the corner, this dude's got a gun, right, talking to some other guy, some other black dude. 
I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends. So we duck behind a car and I'm like, man, we're going to get shot tonight. This is all bad. <laughs> and all of a sudden we hear what we don't want to hear, but we were thankful we heard. The cops are coming. So we get up and I'm like 400 plus pounds at this point. We get up, walk into my car in the middle of the winter, middle middle of night. And as we're walking, we hear this pop, 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 pop. So we start to jog. I start to do my little, you know, waddle, right? <laughs> we get in the car, and at the time, I didn't have a license. It was revoked. And I forgot for what. I think it was like something stupid. <laughs> And at the time, you could, like, pretty much get away with that, right? Like, especially if you just had another person that was going to drive and insurance wasn't a big... It was big, but it wasn't like if you didn't have your insurance, they were going to, you know, take you to jail or take, you know, impound your car. So anyway, come over with this alibi. I tell my buddy Dre, hey, man, if uh, if they stop us... And I'll just say I'm backing out for you and you're going to drive us home. He's like, all right, cool. And my buddy, other buddy in the back, Jojo. Jojo stutters, right? He's like, <laughs> I'm like, it'll be all right, bro. It'll be all right. And we're driving along. Ain't got no heat in the car, so the windows are frosted. I'm trying to, like, get the windows all, like, like clear so I can see fully so I can get out of there and so we can go home. All of a sudden we see the infamous light. And I'm thinking like if I drive slow, maybe they'll just let us go. Driver, stop the car. Driver, turn the engine off. I'm like, oh no. What happened? <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know. And so then I put my hands up. They tell us to put our hands up. Put my hands up. I have my window down. And I'm talking to the cop. He's talking to me. Keep your hands up. And I'm like, sir, I'm really tired. Like, and I didn't say it like this, but I'm thinking like, I'm 400 pounds. I'm sweaty. My heart's beating right now. I I can't keep my arms up. This is not happening. And so, but I'm communicating this to the officer. Officer, please, can I put my hands at least outside of the car so you can see them. My arms are not going to hold my hands up much longer. So they allowed me to do that. I put my hands out the window. I look to my right. Dre is sitting there, my other buddy. And he's on the phone with his girlfriend, baby. They got us again. <laughs> we were fulfilling the, the role that we saw that we were consuming. Jojo's in the back. <laughs> and I'm turning around. It'll be all right, bro. It's going to be okay. Because I was always taught to be respectful, regardless. I turn around. There's three shotguns, six handguns about three feet away from me. I, I have now entered the twilight zone. This is the first time I... As an adult, this is the first time this has happened. I'm like, woo. And now I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I don't know what I've done. So I get out the car because they tell me to get out the car and stand in front of the car. I'm fulfilling the same role that I have consumed for so many years. Boys in the Hood, Minister Society, Above the Rim, New Jack City, and others. And I'm standing there and got my hands up. And I'm looking at Dre. I'm looking at Jojo. And the only thing that snaps me out of this is hearing the police say, if you don't turn around right now, we will kill you. What? And I, oh, no, 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 no. Lift your shirt and turn, your, you know, turn around. They want to see if I had a weapon on me, right? And I yell. What did I do? And they're not telling me what I've done. I have no clue. No clue. 
So they see I don't got no weapons. And I'm standing on, then I put my hands down. They tell me to put my hands down, put my hands behind my back. And I'm thinking they're going to come and put cuffs on me, right? They tell me, walk backwards slowly. Now, mind you, again, it's February. It's winter in Alaska. We're in an alleyway with snow and ice. I'm walking backwards as slow as I can. Like, okay, I'm not trying to get shot today, tonight, whatever. I slip on the ice. And I catch myself. Driver, if you make another sudden move like that, we will kill you. What did I do? Tell me what I've done. I've not done anything wrong. They're still not telling me nothing. I get, you know, regain my composure. And I get to the... Uh, Hold on right quick. I'm going to make sure that, uh, oh, there we go. So make sure the phone doesn't ring or somebody doesn't come through. I put it on airplane mode right quick. <laughs> so I get to the car and you know, back in the day and maybe even still now, the, the back of them cars are as small as all get out, man. I get to the back or I get to the car. They stuff me back in there, right? And I'm laying with my hands behind my back. And before anyone says they can't breathe, I can't breathe. I'm 400 plus pounds. And I'm like, sir, I can't breathe. Sir, I am scared. I don't know what I've done. They still haven't told me nothing. I'm starting to kind of shake. And I'm like, I don't know what I've done. This is the first time I've been in a cop car. Well, at least in this position, right? Because, side note. So then, I'm in a cop car. I'm calmly, to the best of my ability, talking to these cops. Sir, please let me out. Sir, I'm not going anywhere. You guys got guns. I, I'm not running anywhere. Sir, what did I do? Sir, I'm scared. Sir, I can't breathe. Finally... One of the cops tells his buddy, he says, why don't you go on the other side and push him out like they're going to give birth to me, right? So he goes to the other side of the car. And somehow, you know, I'm sitting up now. And he pushes on me. He's like, boom, shoves me hard. And my knee cracks up against the metal frame. I'm sitting there, boom, 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 boom. And I was like, Ugh. I'm like, I was big, right? <laughs> and they're like, you need to calm down. So at this point, now I'm angry and I'm pissed. And I'm cussing them out. I ain't calming down for no mother, blah, 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 blah. You gonna let me up? Blah, 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 blah. I asked calmly. I was nice. I was respectful. Da, 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 da. So finally they stand me up and they take the handcuffs off me. And I'm looking around. And in the alleyway is everybody. There's Polynesian, there's Filipino, there's Asian, there's white, there's black, there's, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, man, what is that? Tongan, man, there was everybody. Because Alaska is very, very versatile, right, in ethnicity. It always kind of has been for a long time. You can thank the military for that. It's pretty neat. But I'm looking around like I'm the only one in the cop car. And so the police are saying, well, we need to take information. We need to take your pictures. And then finally, they get to it to the bottom line of it all. Well, you just match the profile. Pause. Before you start tripping and like, oh, they profiled you. They profiled you. Those cops were doing their job, man. I would have profiled me too. Because the person that they were after was this big dude, raggedy hair looking cat that looked a lot like me. They, should they have done it a little bit differently? They probably should have answered my questions. They probably should have asked me my name. 
They probably should have done a lot of things, but they didn't. And so anyway, that was another one of my experiences with what we would call police brutality that I experienced in Alaska. Now, it took a long time, man. It took a long time for me to come to a place where I'm an individual. I'm not being hunted like the media has told me I am. I'm actually very intelligent. I'm not oppressed. It took a long time. It took a lot of hard conversations. And a long, a long time. But, but here's the point though too. I'm not arguing that there's not disparities. I'm not. But I'm I'm not either agreeing that all white people are my oppressor and all cops are bad. They're not. They're not at all. I refuse to believe that. Adamantly refuse that. I reject that narrative. I reject it even more now that I see that it has been and is the primary objective of the powers that be that are very Marxist at root that just want to destroy America. They don't really care about race. They don't really care about sex. They don't. I generally ask my friends or people when I get in these conversations, I said, what is worse than a racist? And they kind of caught their head, right? What's worse than a racist? There's nothing worse than a racist. And then they, uh, a rapist. Nope. Uh, a pedophile. Nope. Not even a pedophile. Mm -mm. Uh... Dang, um, shoot, um, somebody that can't cook. I said, no. The nihilist. And they stop. You see, the, the nihilist, and this is what I say. The, the racist hates my skin. I haven't met one yet. But hates my skin. And hate your skin. Right. The nihilist hates my very being and desires for me to cease to exist altogether. You see, we are in the age of nihilism. To do away with the very essence of being at all, if you notice. If I can become a woman, I can just walk out of the house and, and proclaim that I feel like a woman and become a woman, but I do not know at all how to be a woman other than to dress like one and, uh, you know, to start talking like one. And I don't know, any, hardly any woman like, you know, girl, you're so, you know, mm, yeah, mm. Uh, what women are you hanging around with, bro? Come on. This this craziness, right? Like, how in the world, side note, how is it that we've come to this place for, for years, for the last 20, 30 years, it was don't beat women, right? Treat women with respect, right? A, a woman is precious, right? To... I could, I, as a dude, I could beat the junk off of a woman. I can, I can uh, culturally appropriate a woman and vice versa and steal away the hard work that many women have done. Come on, you've got to be joking. Like that is dumb, stupid, retarded. That's a sickness. <laughs> like, and, and most that are authentic about it will tell you, yes, I do have a sickness, but this is who I, I choose to be. You're in America. You do what you want to do. But this whole idea 
of extinguishing one to become the other while not at all being the other and proclaiming that that is normal it is no, 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 no. You got, you got me twisted. <sighs> but see, coming back to the point of police, a lot of hard conversations. Uh, a lot of really good conversations that I know I am not an oppressed black man. However, it's interesting in California here. For the first time, just the other day, I had a conversation with a white person. And they are a white liberal. I say that because of the conversation we had. They were so very concerned about being the oppressor that they got mad at me for saying that I'm a free thinker, I'm not oppressed. They wanted me to really understand how oppressed I was. And I explained, I said, don't you understand this is reverse racism? You are not my enemy. And, and, and the, the fact that you want to prove to me that you're my enemy so bad while I'm standing here, you're not, you're not. And they get angry? That's like Twilight Zone, bro. Twilight Zone. If you're white and you've been told that you are the oppressor, I'm here to tell you, no, you're not. Unless you choose to be and you really are. And if you are black or brown or any other color and you've been told that you are the oppressed, I'm here to tell you, no, you're not. You're not oppressed. No, no, no. And you should reject that. You should reject that so much that it makes you vomit to believe at all that you are or ever were. It should make you sick. It should make you angry that you have been fed a narrative that you are not anything better than what you really want to be. It should make you sick. You should really think about that. There's a narrative being being sold and has been sold that you're just the oppressed, I'm the oppressed, and I can't be any better. And so somebody just has to give me things in order for me to be better. Think about that for a moment. Like, because you can't work... Because you can't do what you have the ability to do with the potential that you have and the potential that is undiscovered, you're just oppressed. And I'm your savior. Yeah, that's idolatry. No, reject that. Just reject it. Reject the heck out of it. It's not true. With that said, and lastly, I started by saying I'm wrestling. I know that there are those systems and have been some systems where these things have happened historically. Where some people have it better or have better opportunities. I know that's true. And while that may be true, I cannot fault people if they really don't understand that part of it. That, yeah, you've had some better opportunities based on proxy of where you grew up. For instance, I know what good salmon looks like. California doesn't have a lot of it. But they think they do. I look at the salmon in the stores. I'm like, what is that dead, pale, Frankensteinish stuff? Salmon. I'm like, that's not good. Oh, it's so good. No, you don't know good salmon yet. I need to take you, <laughs> take you to Alaska and go fishing to really get some fresh salmon. Like, I'll go pick one up out the river for you. <laughs> for reals, man. Like. There are some, some things happening where people 
humanity has been oppressed in different ways by humanity, by evil hearts. However, just because I didn't have it as good as somebody else doesn't mean that I can't have it as good as them or better by putting in the work. And, 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 also, what my position is and what other people should be if you have come out of hard times is go to teach somebody else how to do it for themselves too and stop accepting this narrative of being oppressed. That's so depressive. That's so, that's just death. You're accepting death. That's like, that's just, you're waiting to die. Oh, I'm oppressed and I'm angry about it and it's your fault. So I'm going to take everything you got while I'm being the oppressed and you're my oppressor. And I'm just waiting to die anyway, so I'm going to live it up. What kind of stupid nonsense is that? How about I have potential and I have unknown potential within me that I'm going to work to find, but I need some tools. So I'm going to go find somebody that has those tools to help me. Then I'm going to find somebody to show me how to use those tools so that it also helps me. Then once I get good at that, I'm going to develop a skill. Then once I develop that skill, I'm going to take these tools. I'm going to take the know-how of the tools and I'm going to take the skill and I'm going to go teach somebody else how to do the same thing. How about that. I'm not oppressed, but I do understand that there's a balance. I do understand that because I've experienced both sides. So I want to help both those who are authentically oppressed, those who think they're oppressed, those who are not oppressed, and those who want to do their best. I want to bring those together. We keep doing this instead of doing this. Think about it.